Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here for our Cosmic Conversations. My name is Josh Roberts. I'm part of the Morrison Planetarium team at the California Academy of Sciences, and it's my privilege to get a chance to participate in your house for a very cool science presentation called Cosmic Conversations. We try and bring in a science specialist from our wide family and friends from the Morrison Planetarium to give us some content about their expertise. And today we'll be hearing from Ryan Wyatt, our senior director of Morrison Planetarium. Here's Ryan. Hello. As well as Barbara Rojas Alaya, who is for our uh, narrator for our upcoming planetarium show, Big Astronomy. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Hi. How are you? So in Big Astronomy, we talk about a lot of really cool stuff happening in Chile and the telescopes that are there. Ryan or Barbara, is there anything you'd like to share? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Abs, for joining us from Chile. Uh, only a couple hours time difference, luckily, but uh, really glad to have you here to talk a little bit about some of the things that we talked about in the, the planetarium show, which will be opening in September, uh, either uh, live in planetariums or we're looking at ways to stream it since a lot of planetariums may not even be open in September. Um, but then also talk a little bit about your personal experience uh, getting into astronomy and some of the things that you study. Uh, so thanks for your time and thanks for joining us. No, thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure, you know, to be here and be able to talk about astronomy and my country. Very cool. Well, I think one of the cool aspects of the of the show is talking about why Astro uh, Chile is such an important place for astronomy. And I think we had some kind of cool visualizations of uh, wind okay. and weather that contribute to that. Yeah. So hopefully you folks can see a big blue map with some moving green stuff. This is a map made available from the nullschool.net if you folks want to check it out aggregating u.s national weather service data along with nasa data that's actually showing us the temperature of air at the surface of planet earth and barbara maybe you can correct me i tried to put that green spot as close to where the alma array would be as possible but i will yeah, yeah. as a that's product of the california public school system my geography is not great so no that's perfect yeah that's fine so if you folks have a chance to look at your screen, you should see these moving lines, each one indicating sort of a vector for wind and how fast it's traveling. You can play around with this. Now I'm not seeing too much activity uh, right where that green cursor is compared to the areas around it. Why is having such a low wind speed an important thing for Alma? Well, one of the things that we really want as astronomers um, in the optical and in, in the infrared and in the sub millimeter wavelengths is to have a very stable atmosphere, right? All the light that comes from, you know, planets, stars, galaxies has to pass through our atmosphere and that our atmosphere is full with atoms, etc. cetera. So, um, especially molecules. Um, so the desert, the Takama desert in, in my country, it's the driest desert on earth. So there is very little water in the atmosphere, which is great because then photons can pass through the atmosphere without being, you know, uh, intercepted or captured by these molecules. Um, and also you want a stable atmosphere, right? You don't want winds. You don't want um, anything that basically can perturb or, you know, um, affect the image that you can get uh, of whatever you're observing. So if folks take a look now, we've got this change of blue and yellow. This is showing us the relative humidity, the amount of moisture that's contained in the air. You look right around Alma and the Atacama is very, very yellow. That's telling us it's really dry. And for contrast, you can look down where we heard it was raining today in Santiago. Yes. Yeah, even, even south. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of other spots on our globe are this pale blue, indicating that they're experiencing extreme rainfall, including it looks like around the Amazon. But I suppose that shouldn't be surprising to anybody. So yeah, that said, this, I do remember I got we got uh, caught with our production team in a snowstorm at Alma. So there is bad weather there sometimes. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, during the summer, which is called you know the the Bolivian winter. Um, you have that, uh, you have to remember that this is really high altitude stuff, right? We're, we're talking about the Andes. Um, and, and indeed, during the summer, they do suffer of storms. And usually at that altitude, it is basically uh, snow. 
So that's something that does happen in ALMA. Um, it doesn't happen in other observatories. For example, at the CTIO, that doesn't happen. It will happen probably in winter, but not during the summer. Um, so it depends on, you know, the, the month of the year and where are you observing, like what are the conditions that you can, you can find. Well, and you mentioned CTIO, so that's the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. Yes. And, uh, and that's kind of where the sort of story of astronomy started uh, in certain ways in Chile, right? Yes. Um, so the, the astronomy in Chile started basically um, uh, in the late uh, 1800s, where um, people wanted to uh, build a national observatory. Uh, and in the mid in the mid uh, 20th century, um, the director of the National Observatory uh, of Astronomy here in Chile um, had a huge role in trying to convince scientists in the states and in Europe that Chile had the perfect you know weather conditions uh, and geographical conditions uh, to do astronomy, but also that there was a government that was really into you know, um, inviting them to put telescopes here and that we have the infrastructure, you know, to do it. We had basically the technology. And this is a really the, old picture though, right? I mean, it looks like it's from the 19th century, but it's actually from like 1963. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this one, I think it's, uh, it comes from the CTIO website. You can go and, and try to find them. And you can see all of these people in donkeys. So this was a, a group of people that came from Aura, the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, and um, people that were from Europe, from the ESO, from the European Southern Observatories that also wanted to install uh, some uh, telescopes or observatories in the Southern Hemisphere. And you can see them here uh, testing basically a site that it's very close to where, you know, Cerro Tololo is now. And in order to get there, they had to, you know, wow. use mules or donkeys or horses. I thought the road there now was rocky, but it's yes. <laughs> not the good it's, comparison. It's true. <laughs> uh, um, you kind of just go with any car there. It's still... Um, uh, it, it is a still, like you said, it, it is kind of rocky, it's true, yeah. But then we fast I, forward a few years and um, they're actually, I think this is building the foundation of the, the four meter telescope? Yes, the Blanco telescope. Um, indeed, the dome, it's actually quite big compared to, you know, a more modern uh, four meter telescopes. Uh, there is another 4.1 meter telescope in a hill close to CTIO, the SOAR telescope. And when you compare the domes, the dome of the new one, it's very tiny. Mm -hmm. um, and this one was very large just because of uh, the way that the telescope was built and how it, you know, it's supposed to move. Um, it's, it's very similar to uh, the dome that you have in Kick Peak, for, for example. And then, uh, well, I think we'll see pictures of the dome later, but the, uh, the there's a lot of infrastructure in the dome too. I mean, it's like seven stories tall just before you even get to the the, uh, the telescope. Yeah, because everything was happening in, in that building now. I mean, at the time, right? Now with the more modern ones, basically they right. have the things separately, right? The machine shop and everything, it's in another building and not necessarily where the telescope is. And then, Oh well, yeah, maybe you can tell us a little about these other images. Yeah, I think this is when basically uh, they inaugurated the road uh, to go mm. up to CTIO. So they're cutting their uh, this this thing, right? I kind of remember the name in English. Uh, well, the ribbon, the, yeah. the ribbon. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it looks like they've got some waiters in the background, so at least they're not. <laughs> yeah, probably they have some pisco sours there. <laughs> and then. Uh, um, Actually, talking about a blast from the past, um, looking through an actual eyepiece of a telescope, that's also something that <laughs> doesn't happen much anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, but however, there are still, you know, people that believe that this is the way that astronomy is done. 
Uh, and this is a question that actually a lot of people ask about like, how are we observing or what we're looking and how we do it. Um, this is uh, President Frey when it was really inaugurated, the CTIO. Um, you can see also everybody, it's very, you know, well dressed uh, <laughs> with tides and everything. I don't think I have ever seen an astronomer like that in the mountains ever observing like that. Exactly. Well, then actually CTIO is also where you got your personal start in astronomy. So I'm going to do a little switcheroo here and maybe uh, give you a different blast from the past. <laughs> yeah. From the early 2000s when I was an undergrad. Yeah. Um, my first experience um, in an observatory was actually at the CTIO. I was selected as uh, one of the students, kind of an REU student. Um, uh, the REU program, the research for undergraduates. Um, and it was fun. And I think it was when I really realized what astronomers, observational astronomers uh, can do. And actually, I, it got me really motivated to continue a PhD. At the time, I was doing my undergrad at Universidad de Chile. And uh, it was great to have young researchers there that were very into, you know, encourage us to follow a career in, in science. And um, most of them were very, very, um, I, yeah, encouraging me to just continue and say, hey, why don't you go and do a PhD in the States? You can apply there, you can get a fellowship, you can get, you know, a stipend, and it was great. And this yeah. is how most of astronomy is done today now, looking at computer monitors rather than through the eyepiece. Exactly. It, it's not like what we're seeing there. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we use computers. Um, usually, I, uh, when I you know, give talks, outreach talks, I try to uh, find a picture where you know, uh, people can see what we really do when we're there. Uh, mm -hmm. Even now in more modern and bigger telescopes, you're not alone. You usually have somebody that has the preparation um, to basically control the whole um, uh, telescope. And usually you're just in charge of the instrument that you're using. Right. Um, and it's full with the screens where you can see the weather, you can see a lot of stuff. And that this is actually in one of the control rooms for the, for the telescope, correct? Yes, uh, let me see. I don't. I cannot see yes. the picture. I think we're still oh. seeing the one of the president. Uh oh, sorry. I thought I. Yeah. I thought I switched it up. So we haven't been looking at pictures no. at all. Sorry. No, we haven't. I'm flying a little blind. <laughs> <laughs> we're. Um, uh, I'm using a different uh, suite of technologies than I have in the past. So I'm so sorry. Let me uh, okay. go back and give you a chance to talk about. Now, are you seeing the pictures of? Yes. Excellent. Very yeah. Good. So. For example, the picture that we see there, it's a picture of the 0.9 meter uh, telescope, the observing room. Um, so you can see that there, there are four people. I was terrified making a mistake <laughs> where we're observing like there. Because I have this guy behind me. Um, <laughs> And and basically, we spent this. This was probably either my first day or my first week, really observing. We were doing photometry. We were observing some uh, cataclysmic variables uh, for Linda. That it's right there. She was a fellow. She was a postdoc at ESO at that time. Um, now she she still works at ESO. Um, and I think at the end of that day, we were observing a, a globular cluster. And that was really fun because um, I, I was able to see an image really of, you know, how it looks and, you know, the density of stars and everything. It was really fun. But I was terrified of making, you know, a mistake. <laughs> well, I think we have a happier picture of you over here. <laughs> yeah, that was that, uh, because it was a, a research experience. Each of the students that were involved, you know, there had a, a specific project. We have our own mentor. Um, and at that time, I was working with um, Spectra from Gemini. Gemini was oh. recently inaugurated, right. uh, South, uh, Gemini, uh, Gemini South. And um, 
I was working with data of galaxies. And what we were trying to do was a rotational curves of uh, dwarf galaxies, that it was something that was not you know, done at the time. Um, and I was able to actually measure differences, uh, velocity differences, and see these rotation curves. Um, it was fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, it was very different from the things that I had worked uh, as an undergrad. I, I work with the stars, so working with galaxies was a really good thing to realize if I like them or not. Right, that's good. <laughs> and I continue with the stars. So I think <laughs> I like the stars more. Um, and there, there is a picture of all of the participants of the RUU uh, via program of 2004. We are the, you cannot see it, but that's the kind of there, there is these stairs right next to the Blanco telescope, the four, um, the four meter telescope. Yeah, we're there inside the dome and the telescope is behind us. I'm trying to give a sense of some of these. Um, maybe what I'll do is, uh, if you don't mind, switch to the, we actually have, um, it's not, unfortunately, like I said, we can't really go in the dome right now, but maybe uh, we can share a little bit of the show with with uh, with people. Um, and I'm just gonna show a, what amounts to a sort of an HD version of it. Um, right. But um, we can visit some of the. Uh, so here we're just um, we're seeing where the show starts, which was actually the Gemini telescope that you mentioned um, earlier. Yeah, it's an eight meter telescope. And actually, yeah, like you mentioned with the domes, the, the dome is actually kind of a similar size to something like the, um, in fact, a little bit lower than the uh, than the, the CK Blanco dome. Yeah. And here you can get also get a sense of the beautiful Chilean skies, which I think are, it's hard to describe to anyone who hasn't been there. It's one of those things. That's... Yes, it is. Um, it's, I think, when you go there and you you get out of the dome right in the middle of the night and you realize that you know you can see the milky way like you have ever seen it if you live in a city for example where there is you know a light pollution um you fall in love there um i really enjoy every single time that i go to you know the mountains um actually you we had so many stars yeah, sorry, we had a question uh, from online sure. about uh, uh, native peoples of Chile and uh, and w what their relationship was to astronomy, given the, the beautiful night sky. Yes, um, so it, it's hard to know because um, especially the cultures that live in northern in the northern uh, part of Chile where it's so dry and everything, they live by the coast. Uh, they did travel through the desert. Uh, but most of the cultures didn't have um, written stuff, right? But what we're able to see is that we see drawings or petroglyphs of things, you know, that they have there. Um, the, the cultures that are in the southern part of Chile, it's very rainy. Right. However, they did have a relationship with um, the sky and how, you know, the earth was warm. Um, one thing that is quite interesting, I was reading about this, is that they have the name for the first object that came out in the sky. We usually think of, the, of it as uh, Venus, mm -hmm. but they didn't make a distinction between if it was Venus or if it was some other star, for example. Uh. They used the same name for the object that uh. will go up. The Something first. that is interesting for the, the cultures in the north, and especially also um, the ones in Peru, Bolivia, and northern Chile, is that um, they have what they call these uh, the dark constellations. Something that is not common in the northern hemisphere. Here, since we are in the southern hemisphere, we're looking towards the center of the galaxy. So when you look at the Milky Way, um, there is a higher density of the stars, and that allows us to see places in the Milky Way where there's basically no stars because it's dark, right? Actually, there are clouds or something. If um, if Josh can reshare the video, um, 
I think uh, Josh is kind of the one behind the scenes here. This is actually an image of Alma, but in the background you can see the Milky Way and exactly. some of those dark dust lanes. And uh, exactly. So so those cultures, the ancient cultures, they will use those ones as constellations. They will call them names. Uh, there is one that is a llama. There is a fox. There is a frog, and there is this whole story about what is happening with those animals. Uh, the little uh, there is a big llama, and there is a little llama, and they're not made of you know bright stars like we usually think of constellations, but actually just these voids of you know light. It's fascinating. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, and it's and it's so interesting that like you know we're so kind of in our connect the dots mode of thinking about constellations. It's really interesting to think about it uh, this guy in this very different way. Um, yes. Well, and actually, since we're looking at Alma, maybe it's a good time to just talk a little bit about what makes Alma different. We were talking about um, its location in the Atacama Desert and, and how it's very high altitude and up in the northern part of Chile. Yeah. It's a very different kind of telescope from CTIO. Yes. So, so this is a sub millimeter, basically, observatory. Uh, for sub millimeter observations, you really, really don't want any water or humidity in the atmosphere. So um, these things are really, really, really high in the Altiplano. And they're huge, right? This is a huge a group <laughs> of, of antennas uh, to do this uh, sub-millimeter astronomy. And here you're showing one of this, um, this kind of, yeah, basically that's what it is. They carry all of this different antennas um, to the sites, right? It's an interferometer, so you can play uh, where you place the antennas in this, um, in, in the Altiplano, and you can create basically a larger um, telescope that will give you higher resolution. It will allow you to see better whatever you're trying to, to get at these sub-millimeter wavelengths. But to do that, you actually have to physically move these giant dishes from one place to another, which is pretty, yes. pretty extraordinary. You have, yeah, you basically, they. I think they built this machine, right? Just specifically yeah. for this type of antennas. There are three types of antennas. They're not all the same because Alma, it's a collaborative uh, project. So you have antennas that were designed in the US, you have antennas that were done in Europe and ones that were done in Japan. But they all work together uh, and yeah, they have to build this thing <laughs> just to move them around the site of Alma uh, to get the different configurations, right? In, in when, you, when you have an interferometer like this one, you can offer the observer different configurations that will satisfy any conditions for the observation that they're trying to do. Um, in the VLA, for example, in the States, uh, they don't do this with this. Uh, big trucks, but they have train lanes. So they move the antennas oh, using the, yeah. the rails. Well, maybe um, what we could do is, sorry, we're kind of zipping through the show here, but um, since yeah, we're, we've are we actually gone through a lot of our time already, um, why don't we go ahead and maybe talk a little bit about some of the, one of the big future projects, uh, which is the, uh, the Vera and Rubin telescope that's being built not far from Gemini and CTIO. Exactly. That's that's one of these kind of new ways of do astronomy. We are in this big data, right, era. And this telescope, it's really impressive because it's basically making movies of the sky every night. Uh, we're going to be able not only to see beautiful images uh, of the, the, the sky, but we're going to be able to see them through time. So it's basically watching a movie of the, of the sky. Um, the idea of this telescope is basically look at anything that is variable, anything that changes with time. Uh, so we expect that a lot of new discoveries are gonna happen, right? You can think of supernovae, for example, but also you can think of, you know, systems um, that are, are variable just because the star, you know, gets bigger or smaller or because you're looking really at two objects that are, you know, um, occult in each other. Um, you can think of exoplanets. Anything, you know, that it's time variable, 
um, that the, the brightness changes, it's something that this is going to capture for several years. And we um, we didn't get a chance to talk much about your research, but you look at MDWARS, so some of these like smallest, plentiful but tiny stars in our yeah. galaxy, and they also have they have like flares, and and they show variation. Mm -hmm. Is LSST gonna or or the Vera Rubin gonna uh, contribute to some of the work you do as well? Yes, exactly. Um, these the stars MDWARS are very tiny. They're about the 70% of the stars of the galaxy. Uh, but they, some of them are extremely active. You know, they have flaring events that are um, more energetic than anything that we have seen from the sun, for example. And this is something that, yes, we will be able to see those things uh, because um, this telescope, it's large enough to actually see these very dim stars because they're so little, they're cooler. So they're dimmer, you know, than a star like the sun. So it's a little bit more challenging, but the, this telescope has all the all what we need to basically see that activity for these stars. Well, um, uh, I'm sorry that we ran through our time so quickly, yes. but I'm really thrilled that you could join us today. Um, and I'll just mention that we were kind of breezing through some scenes from the show uh, Big Astronomy, um, which uh, uh, is uh, actually produced both in English and Spanish. Um, so, uh, so unfortunately, we're only doing this broadcast in English, but um, the show will appear in both English and Spanish. And for that, of course, we needed a very talented bilingual narrator. And I want to thank you <laughs> again, Babs, for being the narrator for the show and bringing so much of your personality and uh, and your uh, your history with working in in Chile to the to the show to be able to uh, create a really I think authentic experience because the show is about the people who really make these big observatories work. And it was so cool to be able to have uh, an astronomer as a narrator, and you in particular. Yeah. No, I I was so honored, you know, to be part of this project. And I was a little bit terrified about doing it, both the English and the Spanish. Well, you had a second director for your Spanish version uh, of, that was uh, a little more uh, a little more demanding than I was. But I think that yes. <laughs> came out really well. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting that actually it was harder to do the Spanish version than the English version. Yeah. But no, it, I think it's a great project. I think it really shows the show, the diversity um, that exists in astronomy. Um, you don't need to be an astronomer just to be involved, you know, in observatories and in astronomy. And I think the show really shows that. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, it was great that you could share your personal story of how you got into astronomy, but behind all of the people that we talked to, um, uh, everyone has their own story of how they, exactly. how they came to work where they are, which is really just kind of wonderful to hear. And you'll hear some of those stories in the, um, in the show, but I'll just do a little plug here, if you don't mind, for the bigastronomy.org website. We're gonna be sharing a lot of the interviews and, and doing a lot of Kind of live streaming like events like this where we're talking to people uh, as part of the bigastronomy.org um, site and on our, our our YouTube and Facebook channels. So, so we actually kind of piloted it. You you did us double duty. You were on our <laughs> Academy Sciences Morrison Planetarium uh, Facebook Live, uh, but uh, also on our Big Astronomy uh, stream as well. So, thanks yes. again for joining us today. No, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Cool. Well, I don't know if we have any other questions, but I don't see anything else pop up on the screen. Oh, actually, um, our question for will CTIO help find Earth-sized planets orbiting other stars? Do you want to take that? Yes, um, there are several uh, instruments um, right now. Um, for example, in the 1.5 uh, meter telescope, there was uh, an instrument uh, that was basically using the technique of radial velocities. Um, to detect these planets, it, it's Chiron. Um, probably, um, what you really need, it's a very focused instrument to do this. And I think right now, for example, for radio velocity, there is none. However, they are now using all of these small telescopes to do transits, uh, that it's a photometric technique in order that you basically see how the planet occults the star, so the star gets uh, dimmer, less bright. And that's something, for example, that some 
uh, small telescopes can do at CTIO. Um, it, it, it's this, a good point too, because we talked about the, the Blanco telescope at CTIO, which is this sort of the giant dome that you were describing. But there are many, many telescopes at, at CTIO, different sizes. And I think there's even a, a fleet of small telescopes. I don't know exactly. if they're looking for small, for Earth sized planets, but they're looking for, for exoplanets. Uh, yeah. Um, it's it then then it's the the thing about not only having you know the telescope but also you need an instrument that can do the stuff. Uh, so for radio velocities, what you need it's a really stable instrument that doesn't move much. So you can make these measurements that are very uh, precise. Uh, when you do transits, it's a little bit easier. However, for example, the atmosphere plays a huge role, and that's why, for example, TESS exists, uh, that it's a very dedicated um, uh, space telescope just to search for these transits and to search for, hopefully, Earth-sized planets around the closest stars to us. Very cool. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, and I don't see any other popping up, thanks again for joining us. And thank you, everyone thank out there you. who tuned into our Facebook Live and, and uh, today especially our Big Astronomy YouTube and Facebook streams. And uh, we'll hope to see you again soon.